I would like to talk about the principles of sound doctrine. Because sound doctrine is under assault these days. Agents of iniquity had infiltrated the church spreading false doctrines. The Bible says that these people are marked for perdition. These people are irredeemable. They're dragging a lot of Christians on the path of destruction. And Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Let me just pause for a moment. I travel a lot and I preach in many places and so many times in my spirit I feel the opposition to the message of the gospel and to sound principles. There's a lot of opposition nowadays against the truth. We live in those times. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. It's no wonder that nowadays sermons that are not based on the word of God, just stories, sometimes nice ones, interesting ones, experiences and I'm not against experiences but we cannot base our doctrine on experiences but on the Word of God and yet people are drawn to motivational speakers people that do not preach the Word of God so that's why Paul says to Titus Titus chapter 1 verse 1 but as for you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine now everything that I'm gonna say tonight is based on the assumption that you're going to study the Word of God that you have a Bible that you're opening if you don't have a Bible if you never open your Bible, this message, dare I say, is not for you. It will not help you. I am giving you principles of discernment between sound and false doctrines. But the only way you are going to apply these principles is when you have your Bible when you open your Bible every day and everything that is preached on this pulpit or any other pulpit, you put it to the test of the Word of God. People with a special heart, said Apostle Paul, were in Berea. Even what was preached by the great apostle Paul 
had to go through the vetting of the Bible, of the scriptures, these people would take notes, would go home, and would put the sermons of the great apostle to the test of the scriptures. Because the greatest danger in these times is to be deceived. And this is not an excuse. You have the word of God. The only reason you're going to be deceived is when you don't open it. You don't study it. You don't apply it in your life. And you do not verify everything that you hear based on what the word of God says. So what is sound doctrine, obviously, is the truth of God. And what are the principles that you need to apply to everything you hear? To every doctrine. Because as I said, we don't have sound doctrine only. We also have false doctrine. The first principle for a principle to be based on the word of God, it has to be applicable anytime, anywhere, and with everybody. It has to be universal. If it is applicable only in your life, but not in the life of your neighbor, if it's only applicable in America, and not throughout the world. It might be a personal experience. It might be a personal privilege, a personal favor that you get from God. But it is not a principle of sound doctrine. What happened when American theologians started to apply their experiences and introduce them into the gospel. See, we have the gospel of salvation. And what did Paul say? I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God for the salvation. Of all people. The Jews and the Gentiles. That means. When I have this book in my hand. I can go anywhere in the world. And when I preach salvation, I can preach it to everybody. I'm not going to be ashamed. I, there is absolutely no place in this world where I can go and say, I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm so ashamed, this is not for you. And yet, we have Calvinism and predestination, the gospel of predestination, saying that God has a plan for each and every uh, life in this world and people are predestined whether to go to heaven or to go to hell. It's not true. In one of the following lessons I'm going to speak about the immense power of self-limitation. God has that power. Now imagine, God will not limit himself when he speaks to us. His vocabulary, the way of communicating is so perfect that it's absolutely incomprehensible to limited human beings. So as you speak to your child, your baby, or your grandchild, gibberish, and you hope nobody will listen to you outside of the immediate family, because you would look, look like a fool imitating a baby's talk. Imagine the difference between God's perfection in communication and our limitations. 
If he's not limiting himself to our level, he cannot communicate with us. But then imagine when he wants to correct us. And yes, sometimes God has to spank us. As you do with your children and you limit your force and your power, so does God. Otherwise, his discipline would be destructive. He would annihilate us. You know how soft his touch is. From his mighty power to just touching us a little. So he was going to correct us and put us back onto the path of righteousness. That's his love. So we're going to talk more these coming weeks about this awesome attribute of God, the power to limit himself so he can be approachable. See, the incarnation of Christ. Even himself giving himself to die for us. It was the self-limitation of God. We see the self-limitation of God in everything. So yes, God knows everything beforehand. He knew it before the universe was started, was created. But in salvation, he does not bring predestination. He does not bring his pre-knowledge. That's why we see in the Bible a God that is surprised, sometimes curious, sometimes disappointed, sometimes regretful. A perfect, infinite, know-it-all God cannot be surprised. Cannot be regretful. No. The reason he is, is because he enters our space and time, limiting himself and offering salvation through faith and giving us the greatest gift, and that is free will. That in and of itself is a self-limitation of God, just so we won't be robots. So I'm going with the gospel throughout the world, and I preach it, and I'm not ashamed, because I can tell all the people, you can go to heaven, you can be saved. But at the same time, you see the prosperity gospel, and we have a gospel about prosperity, setting up principles on how we acquired our prosperity and what are we doing with it once we acquired it. There are principles about prosperity. But there is no principle that you ought to be rich, that you ought to have everything. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest characters in the Bible were poor people. And some of the greatest were rich people. God does not discriminate between rich and poor. Some people are rich. Some people are poor. But either one of these two categories have access to God, depending on, on their attitude towards possessions. So, the problem with the doctrine of prosperity is not applicable everywhere. If I go and preach in the uh, jungles of the Amazon to those tribes, am I going to be able to say what so many preachers in America say, if you are faithful, you have to have that type of a car? Some preachers even say that God's prosperity gives them Jet planes? No, it's not applicable. So if it's not applicable, it might be a personal experience, it might be a personal favor from God, 
but it's not sound doctrine. It's not a universal principle that you can apply to everyone's life. And on this pulpit, we can say God will give you personal experiences. But the demands, the requirements for a sound doctrine and sound Christian life are only those principles that can be applied anytime, anywhere, and with everybody. Look at the golden verse of the Bible. For God so loved the world. What does it mean? It doesn't love the world and the things of the world, right? Because the Bible says we shouldn't. It's, it's, it's something different. The world means people. All the people in one big world. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. That is the universal principle of salvation. And faith is the universal requirement for salvation. Whoever you are, all over the world, the condition is believing. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is a problem with uh, the theology about suffering. You see, there is so much suffering all over the world. Everybody in the world, no matter their possessions, no matter their wealth, everybody goes through a lot of trouble, tribulations, problems in their families, their health. And there is a doctrine about suffering which some in this society would reject out of hand like it is not biblical. No. Listen, health is not guaranteed. Everybody is going to die someday because they're going to have a health problem. And I'm not talking about rich people who can buy the best care in the world. I'm talking about prophets that communicate directly with God. Isn't it amazing that Elisha, in one verse, the Bible takes him out. Elisha got sick and he died. That's it. That's it. He performed double the number of miracles as his master, Elijah. And yet, he died. He still had a miracle in his life, which was not yet performed. And in his grave, when a dead man was thrown over his bone, bones, he was resurrected. And yet, he died because he got sick. So the Bible says in Romans 5, 3 and 4, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, that is theology. Our attitude in, in the suffering should be rejoicing. Why? Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Suffering is not only a curse in this world, it is a privilege, it is a necessity to form our character. I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us, Romans 8, 18. So, if I say Everybody is going to be rich and everybody is going to be healthy. Is that a true doctrine? Reality will contradict me. But if I say everybody has problems, everybody suffers sooner or later, more or less, is that the truth, brothers and sisters? Can I preach that somewhere 
amongst the homeless? Can I preach that in a palace? I can preach it everywhere. Because we live in a world of suffering. And when I say everybody suffers, and of course we are not diminishing the possibility of miracles and healings. We've experienced it. But if I say everybody is healthy, everybody is rich, if you believe in Christ, that's not a biblical principle. If I say everybody suffers, now that's reality. Another principle of sound doctrine, it has to be written in black and white as an imperative in the Bible, either as one direct statement or as a corroboration of related principles. See, when you have statements about morality, thou shalt be holy. Communion, if you do not partake, you're not going to have life. Washing of the feet of the saints. We read this morning, we talked about it this morning. If you know these things, you have to do them because I gave you an example so that you copy me. And when Jesus give us an ex gave, gives us an example, we better obey. It's a matter of obedience. Head covering. In one of these lessons, we're going to talk about that specifically and very, very in detail, so you understand what the Bible says, not what culture says. But when we talk about drugs, alcohol, and smoking, I've heard a lot of people saying, where does it say in the Bible, thou shall not smoke? They even say, oh, Jesus performed the first miracle, it was changing water, into wine. Let me tell you this. The wine that Jesus gave them woke them up, didn't get them drunk. But what is the general sense of the Bible? What are the verses saying in the Bible? The one that destructs the temple of God, which is your body, God will destruct him, will destroy him. Because you cannot drink alcohol, smoke, use drugs, and there are not, no consequences to this body. You're destroying your body. And this is your body given for a time, but is the creation of God and belongs to God. So there are a lot of corroborations in the Bible that would lead us to believe drugs are sinful, alcohol is sinful, smoking is sinful. Even people in the world have laws against drinking, have a limit. And th these are worldly people. In the church, we believe in total abstinence because nobody can set the level of acceptable drinking. If you can drink a drop, what is the difference between a drop and two? What is the difference between two and a glass? What is the difference between a glass and a bottle? What is the difference between a bottle and No, the limit for these destructive things is zero tolerance. So the principles of sound doctrine, it has to be written in black and white as an imperative in the Bible, either as one direct statement, thou shalt not, or as a corroboration of related principles that come together and give us a clear understanding that something is sinful. Is the principles of what is written and the Bible says in 1st Corinthians 4 6 do not go beyond what is written 
we're trying to uh, bring so many other arguments into our discussion. And I heard a lot of people saying, what about coffee? Uh, what about chewing gum? Yeah, and church is sinful. Why? Because it looks bad. It's disrespectful. If you are invited to the President of the United States office and go in there chewing gum, you're not going to stay there for long. I can assure you of that. But let's not go any further. Um, do not go beyond what is written. Don't bring collateral, circular arguments into it. What about this? What about that? Uh, you're saying we should wear a scarf, but then wives are not submissive to their husbands. No, what does it one have to do with the other? One day we'll talk about submission, and one day we'll talk about obeying the rules of God, as they are. So don't go into circular arguments. Do not go beyond what is written. Some people would say, yeah, but it's written only once in the Bible. Look at this. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this that power belongs to God. So my friends, the Bible has 1,200 pages, around 1,200 pages. If I had somebody write a book with each name of a Romanian who lives in this world, it might be a thicker book than that. I cannot talk about everything, but the principles have general covering over every aspect of our living. And when the Bible says something once, like the washing of the feet of the saints, we should not discard that principle just because it is only written once. God has spoken once, twice I have heard. Another principle of sound doctrine, it has to be conducive to holiness and its components. Modesty, humility, decency, propriety. Talking about dating. No, young people have to meet, right? But there are principles for that. Because it might be conducive to lust and sin. So there has to be limits to which will make that process of knowing somebody and getting to marry somebody a decent, holy, proper process. Jewelry. It's out of necessity. Now, listen, I understand, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, a wedding band, you can argue it has a necessity. It will show that somebody is married. And for societal purposes, that is acceptable. That's why in our churches we don't have a rule against that. But tell me, what is the necessity of earrings? Because if you can argue that earrings are necessary, then you can argue that putting a ring in your nose is necessary. And we know that is necessary for pigs. It is necessary to put rings on pigs' noses so they won't dig holes in the ground. But for people, what would be the reason for these? Around the neck, around the ankles? No. This is a sign of pride. Nothing modest. Nothing humble. And let me tell you, it's not decent 
and it's not proper. And the Bible has clear messages about this saying, your inward appearance is more important than your outward appearance. If you have humility inward, it will show outwardly. Ostentatiously looking close. The Bible speaks against that too. And again, alcohol, drugs, and smoking. Does it lead somebody to holiness? Is it proper? Is it decent? Have you ever seen somebody drunk? Drugged under the influence of drugs? Why do you think it's, it's banished to have smoking in all public places? Because it's toxic. So especially for a Christian, that shouldn't even be an issue for discussion. 1 Thessalonians, it says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Just because it doesn't sound good, just because it doesn't look quite okay, you don't need another argument. Stay away from me, from it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Another principle of sound doctrine, discernment between spiritual and literal. You have to look in the Bible and see if something is meant to be taken spiritually or literally. Now, look at this. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two hands and go into hell into the unquenchable fire. Is it sound doctrine to cut off somebody's hand? Or maybe in a Muslim country, if somebody steals, it is the law. But the idea is not to cut off your hand, it's not to steal anymore might be a social punishment, but we don't advertise it as a biblical way of bringing discipline in somebody's life. And in the same passage, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Jesus said these things. Why don't we cut off our hands? Why don't we take out our eyes? Because the sense here is spiritual. What it says is it would be better to have one less hand or one less eye than to go into hell. The idea is to motivate people not to sin. It's not to cut off their limbs or take out their eyes. So we have to look and discern between spiritual and literal. Another principle of sound doctrine, it has to be considered as what is applicable from the Old Testament into the New Covenant. Because some things were for the Old Testament only. You talk about the Sabbath. Now, Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day of rest imposed upon people since the creation. But even Apostle Paul says, some people would respect one day, some people would honor all days. And it doesn't matter. It's not a salvation requirement. It is a salvation requirement to be in the assembly of the church, to attend church, to come to church, to be in the fellowship of the church, but not one day or another. You see, it cannot be preached in every culture. Why? 
because some people were slaves. And you know that slaves didn't have Sundays, they didn't have Saturdays, they didn't have any free days. They were forced to work. In the book of Corinthians, when uh, Paul clarifies something about the communion, it says, you don't wait for each other. Some people are coming later, and not because they sleep more, right? They come late not because they're, they don't care to be here at the beginning of the service, no. It's because they are slaves. And they come when they are available. Some of you can come earlier. Some of them are let go by their masters later on in the day. So when they come to church, you've already served communion. You've already eaten your meal. Because they ate every day together and they took communion every day together. That, that was what they did at that time. So how can you preach to slaves not doing anything on the day of the Sabbath? And Jesus clarified this. Somebody loses an animal, a domestic animal into a pit. Is it going to let it die there? It doesn't matter that it is a Sabbath. You're going to go and rescue your animal. You need it. So we have to be careful with these things. Circumcision, animal offerings, Jewish celebrations. These rules were applicable in the old covenant. Not in the New Covenant. When you are talking about the law, you talk about three dimensions of the law. It is the ritual or the ceremonial law. Part of that would be Sabbath, circumcision, animal offerings, Jewish celebration. Jesus fulfilled all that through his sacrifice. That's why we don't sacrifice lambs here. Unless it's in the kitchen and we have a meal prepared for the congregation. But it's not a religious ritual. It is not required for our salvation. What do we do with the moral law? It is narrowed. Jesus said, you've heard in the law, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. You have heard in the law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery. So he fulfilled the ceremonial law. It's not applicable anymore in our lives. He narrowed the moral law. It's not enough in our lives, the moral law of the old covenant. It's not enough. It is required more of us and then the charitable law we had to love our neighbor as we love ourselves now we have to love our neighbor as we love Christ when we do all these things we do it for him he strengthened the charitable law but we have to make this distinction. And then body piercing and tattoos. Because a lot of people say, well, you know what? It's in the Old Testament. Yes. But it has to deal with a body that was given to you regardless of the historical era in which you live. Whether in the Old Testament or New Testament, you have the same kind of body. And the principles that apply to the body in the Old apply to the body in the new era. You must not make cuts in your flesh for a dead person and you must not make tattoo markings on yourselves. I am Jehovah. And look in the New Testament. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? within you which you have from God also you do not belong to yourselves for you were not for you were bought with a price by all means glorify God in 
your body. And a lot of Christians misinterpret that saying, yeah, but I have a tattoo with a cross or a verse from the Bible. Doesn't matter what you put on your body. It is not a way to honor God. Another principle of sound doctrine, it has to be placed in the right prophetic context and timing. We know a lot about cessationism and continua continuationism. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit and then kingdom now theology. Let's look at some verses. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. So let me ask you, have we experienced perfection yet? The answer is no. No. We're still in the process of being perfected. So the Bible says in 1 John 3, 2, When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church. We will be like him, that means perfect, when we see him in that glorious day. Until then, perfection had not come yet. And we still need prophecies and spiritual gifts and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues and everything pertaining to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when we talk about the kingdom theology, Why is it so dangerous? Because they believe they can conquer territories in this world. And we've tried it before. You know that we had the papal state. We had Christian armies sent to war to conquer lands, even the Holy Land. There were so many wars for that piece of real estate. Probably one of the most contested in history. And you know, I am one that believes that the Holy Land should belong to the Jewish people. I, I truly believe that. I say it unapologetically, not because I am anti any other nation, but because it was given to them by God. And the only one who has the right to take it away from them is God. And he did for a time. But then he gave it back to them. So I believe it belongs to them. But we're not called to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. I've heard about people with a kingdom theology. They go to buildings. Can you believe they anoint buildings with oil? Is that biblical? No. I know that Samuel poured oil on a rock and anointed it and kept it as a reminder of God's great miracles. I understand that. They built altars. But it is not our mandate in this world to take over buildings, to take over territories. There is no such thing as an army of God on this earth. Unless you're talking about the spiritual kingdom of God. And look at that. The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit spirit so they're circling buildings they're circling territories they're praying over buildings to become territories of the kingdom of God until that day comes when Jesus will establish his kingdom on this earth and the whole earth is going to be his territory until then you know what the territory of the kingdom of God is the lives of the believers, the souls of the believers. This is the kingdom we have to expand. This is where all our energies have to go. Conquering souls for the kingdom of God. That is sound doctrine. 
Not the fact that we're going to pray over some things and they belong to God then. No. Another principle of sound doctrine, and it will be the last tonight, it cannot contradict other scriptures and the general sense of biblical principles and spirit. One of the biggest traps in modern Christian theology is abortion exceptions. And I've heard preachers saying that it is acceptable. Christian politicians would compromise right here because a pregnancy would take place in terrible circumstances, I would agree with that. Because the life of the mother is at peril or because the child forming inside is somehow deformed. Listen. There are no exceptions admitted by the Bible when it comes to abortion. There are other ways to deal with things like that. They're using a few specific situations, drastic tragedies, dramas, to justify their quest for sin without consequences. Because what is a baby is a consequence, is a biological consequence. And to avoid babies as consequences, they use abortion for most cases. Not because the child has a deformity, not because the life of the mother is at peril, in danger, not because the pregnancy occurred in traumatic situations, but because they want to facilitate a free lifestyle that would get rid of the consequences of sinful acts. And under no circumstances, Christians can accept any kind of killing when it comes to babies, because the instinct of a true mother is not to take the life of her child so that she can survive. The instinct of a true mother is to give her life, to save the life of her child. So, when it says, thou shalt not kill. We have to be very careful because this society goes the way of the Nazis who proclaim that every child that has a deformity once they found out needs to be disposed of. I am going to tell you, ask the parents with children with special needs if they love them any less than they love their perfectly normal children. You know how much a parent sacrifices when they have a child with special need? You know how much trouble they go through? But they won't give that child up because it's their child, it's part of their lives. We live in a society that pretends 
to become God. And we have not the right to accept that. So careful because no doctrine can contradict other scriptures, even though in the context of when which it was written, it might seem shady. You have to search more because it is a context and it is an explanation for it. You know that sometimes the Bible expresses itself in a sarcastic way. We have to be careful that no scripture would contradict other scriptures. So, just a short recap. When we talk about the principles of sound doctrine, it has to be applicable anytime, anywhere, and with everybody. When we talk about the principles of sound doctrine, it has to be written in black and white as an imperative in the Bible, either as one direct statement or as a corroboration of related principles. It has to be conducive to holiness and its components, modesty, humility, decency, and propriety. It has to discern between spiritual and literal. It has to be considered as what is applicable from the Old Testament into the New Covenant and what is not. Then it has to be placed in the right prophetic context and timing. And then it cannot contradict other scriptures and the general sense of biblical principles and spirit. Now, everything that I've said has a prerogative. You gotta have a Bible and you have to keep it open. If you don't, none of this will help you. I've said, and I'm gonna say it for the young generation, there are two kinds of Christians in this world. The true Christians and the in quotes Christians, Christians with quotation mark, pseudo-Christians. I do not believe a true Christian functions and is a true believer without one hour of prayer every day and one hour of reading and studying the scriptures every day. I don't believe it. I've seen too many people defeated in their lives of faith because there's no prayer and no scriptures in their lives. And you might say, well, but they're not nice people. Nice people are not necessarily true believers. You know that hell is going to be full of nice people. But unbelievers, you cannot be faithful to the Lord ignoring his word and ignoring him cannot be it's impossible so if you want sound doctrine if you don't want to be deceived read your bible every day pray every day come to church often and dedicate your life to christ and this is what we're going to ask christ tonight to give us power to live a holy life, a biblical life, based on his principles and on his teachings. Let's stand and let's pray.